You're not gonna keep this take as the first take. Um, I kind of decided to do this impulsively, kind of. Um, I had some friends that were encouraging me to, to share this stuff. Um, and, uh, and I kind of always intended to, I just never seemed to get around to it. And like impulsively today, I decided, well, let's just, let's just do it. So um, what I want to do here is just a shop tour. Um, one thing that I'm kind of concerned about with this kind of video is I hate doing kind of like a look what I have, you know, how lucky I am. Although I am very lucky and grateful. Um, this isn't really supposed to be that. I think what I want to do is kind of point out the things that, um, that I think are innovative. And by the way, this is like not the most um, well-equipped shop you've ever seen. I started just like a, just three, three years ago. And, uh, and I'm trying to be really conservative with, with my spending and how I build the shop up. Um, but, uh, but I am very lucky to, uh, to have been able to do this. It's been a, it's been a lot of fun. Um, it's kind of been a lifelong uh, a dream of mine uh, to, to have a wood shop. You know, ever since watching like Norm Abram on New Yankee Workshop. In fact, when I started doing this, I was kind of sad that Norm wasn't around doing videos anymore. Um, and I wasn't sure like where I was going to take inspiration from, but freaking YouTube has just been ridiculous. Like so many people that I think are, you know, just as good, if not better than he was and, uh, and sharing in a format that's kind of more interactive and, um, it's, it's kind of a golden age to be doing making with, which I think a lot of people understand. Anyways, let's get on with it. Um, so there's, there's the door. Um, this starting off, this is a four car garage, which is pretty luxurious. Um, we do keep cars parked in here a lot of the time, but it's nice, you know, if I'm working on something big, uh, we can pull them out back um, and I have, have more workspace. Um, so uh, you see here is the, the air, air lines, that's, that's the blue, that's the max air, uh, rapid air uh, tubing system. And I have a, a California air tools uh, compressor, which is a nice, quiet compressor. The compressor I had before was would really loud and basically scare the crap out of me every time it would, it would, it would turn on. Um, so I have lines running to different places here by the door, which the idea was basically just kind of blow myself off when I walked out, try to get the dust off my pants and shoes and stuff. Um, but uh, I use it for blowing off parts and, and lots of random stuff. Um, one by the drill press, obviously is very useful. It looks like I kind of need to use it right now. Um, one in the middle here. Uh, I'll go ahead and talk about this now. I call this the squid. It's an area of my ceiling, which I've kind of surrendered to have stuff that's kind of kind of low, hang low and take away headroom, which, you know, is not ideal, but, um, you know, I already have a garage door opener hanging off the ceiling there. So there's already some, um, some sacrifice. So I just kind of clustered things around there. What I have right now are a uh, Dylos uh, dust, uh, particle counter, uh, basically a dust monitor. Uh, once I first started doing this, I wasn't even really uh, that concerned with dust. Like I thought dust collectors were basically just a convenience for people that didn't want to have to clean up. I didn't want to have to run big, big tubes around my, around my shop, taking up space and, and kind of um, uh, uh, making the, the, the space less rearrangeable because you don't want to have to rearrange tubes and stuff. I've since discovered that it's actually a huge health concern. Uh, so that's when I started getting serious about uh, uh, paying attention to my dust situation. Um, I started out with a handheld uh, particle counter, um, which was useful, um, but I decided this continuous thing was a better idea, mainly because I could, uh, well, monitor continuously. So this is a, a Microsoft uh, first generation uh, Surface RT, which is basically useless for almost anything. It just you can't install any apps on it, um, no custom web browsers. Um, I couldn't even run Spotify in a web browser on this thing, the, the Internet Explorer version on it. just isn't very, uh, uh, very powerful. But the thing that it is really great for is a heads-up display. So this thing is a, a graph. Um, I'm, I'm a computer guy and I do uh, sort of reliability engineering. So monitoring is kind of in my blood. I, I know how to do this kind of uh, uh, time series uh, metrics graphing. Um, so the big number there is the small particle count, the, sm the smaller number is the large particle count. The graphs on the left are one hour, the graphs on the right are four hours. So what this has allowed me to do is basically get a handle on things that are generating lots of dust, how much dust it generates, uh, how well the dust collection systems that I use uh, uh, work, and how well the air cleaners work. 
um, how, how fast that dust level can be brought down. Um, so that's all being measured uh, right here, kind of in, in, a, in a, at a head level, sort of almost head level sort of thing. I know dust levels can vary by, you know, how far from the ground you are and even what part of the room you're in. So it's not great, but it seems like probably the best compromise I could have come up with, with having a single sensor. And that makes 300 bucks. I don't want to have, have to buy a bunch of those. Uh, and then uh, power, of course, that's uh, the, the, the ceiling um, power cord reel is super handy. Uh, and I did the same thing with the air hose reel. And uh, last, there's a little um, uh, sawn off RF bridge uh, transmitter receiver. Um, they're, they're these super cheap um, devices, um, but I think you can get them for like 10 bucks. Um, and again, since I kind of have software skills, I was able to, um, to program it to do a ton of different automation things in the shop. Right now, I've decided the sawn off uh, devices are best for receiving uh, signals. They're not great for transmitting signals. Um, the transmission reliability I haven't found is great, but the receiving re reliability I think is quite good. So I was using it to control um, these uh, power sockets that can listen to uh, RF signals and turn things on and off. Um, uh, but now I've switched over to Wi-Fi sockets, so everything turns on and off with Wi-Fi. But I still take a lot of signals, like door sensor signals, um, vibration uh, signals, and uh, mo probably most importantly is uh, these little key fob, uh, key fobs that I have uh, around the shop in a bunch of different places um, to, uh, to transmit that can receive on that device. And then I have a server which listens to those signals and does different things like triggers the Wi-Fi devices on and off. Um, let's see, I want to move that dust monitor over a little bit because it kind of gets in the way when I'm pulling down some of those cords. Um, so that is that. Back to here, that's the dust monitor, um, the little uh, speaker system uh, for Chromecast. Chromecast is awesome. Uh, I'm so happy with it. It's super convenient here in the garage. Um, and, uh, uh, oh, and you know, I can, I can, I, I set up some automation as well that I should talk about probably at some point. Uh, um, not so much hot automation, but interfaces like, so basically my Apple watch, I use an app called that, that on button in the upper left. This is called I control web. And basically you can set up, uh, uh, rest endpoints that are triggered by buttons, uh, uh, on this app. So I can do things like, let's see, what's a good, uh, what, let me turn something on here first. So here's the dust filtering fans. I have one, I have four of them. I don't know what the total CFM is. These things became popular when all the California fires were happening. Uh, they're actually really effective, especially when you have a bunch of them like this. It takes down the dust level uh, really quick. Uh, but then, you know, I can do things like uh, turn it off from my watch here and see if I can get my finger in the picture. Fans off in the upper left. Is this going to work? No, you take my word for it. There, I turned the fans off. Um, so it's nice to have access to a bunch of these functions on my wrist so I can pause the music, play the music, um, turn off. Like I have the, uh, the fans. And I also have some um, uh, these cheap Harbor Freight dust collectors, one for the table saw, you can see the bag of it there, and one for the miter saw, which is probably the biggest dust generator in the shop. Um, this thing is a cyclone and a shop back, which I used to use for the dust collection, which didn't work that great. So I got another one of those Harbor Freight dust collectors and that thing's working awesome. So it's keeping the small particle count down. Um, Let's see, where was I? Um, so, uh, anyways, moving on. Here's this is a, this is my welding set, setup. I'm trying to uh, trying to learn how to do some welding, some uh, some MIG, TIG, and stick. Um, this is the the Harbor Freight Vulcan multi-process machine. It was a thousand bucks, 220 amp. Um, it's uh, I, I'm relatively happy with it. The I took a, um, a TIG class a couple weeks ago, and I like their their TIG machines better than this. Uh, this one you have to strike start the tip, whereas the ones uh, we took we used in class automatically started. I think they call, they call it high frequency starting. 
Uh, so you don't actually have to touch the, the tungsten to the, to the weld in order to get the arc to start. Um, so that's kind of, a, kind of a bummer, but it's cool that I, at least I can do TIG and MIG and stick with this. Um, I haven't played too much with stick. It's really smoky. I think I won't do it unless, um, unless I, I want to play with it for welding materials that are maybe like a little rusty that I'm too lazy to clean off for quick welds or whatever. Um, but yeah, whatever, all, all the different pros and cons of the different welding processes. Um, th that machine I've been pretty happy with. Um, it seems to be, I mean, it's been working okay for a year now. Got a bunch of coupons stacked up here that I bought at um, the Blue Collar Supply. So this is gonna be practice material. I wanna to get to practicing. I had a couple wood projects that I wanna finish up first and clean up the dust before I start making sparks. Uh, it's a laptop for, you know, obviously like looking up reference information, looking up, uh, looking at my design measurement information, um, ordering extra screws and hardware from Amazon when I run low, uh, that kind of thing. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know if you can hear that in the background. Uh, the part of the town that we're in is not the greatest part. There's all kinds of crazy people around here, but luckily we kind of have fences all around the place and it hasn't really been a problem except for when we leave, sometimes we have to have to deal with some crazy when we're coming and going. Um, so yeah, just random stuff, like a couple shelves for stuff that's meant to go up in the, uh, in the attic storage. So that's kind of a to-go table there and uh, some parts uh, for, for projects that I have in flight that are not completed, um, but I wanna get them you know, off the work tables and out of the way. So I kind of try to stack things up there. It's best probably to not have too many projects going at the same time. Uh, you can see here, I probably have a half a dozen plus the stuff that is on the tables. Um, so that's, you know, like whatever, an organization prioritization problem on my part. Um, this is a table uh, that I got uh, as a hand-me-down from my office. Um, the thing that I like about it is that uh, the, the legs, uh, uh, there's there's not a lot of diagonal support which is bad structurally but it's good if you want to be able to push stuff up underneath the table I decided I want to have everything in the shop, shop on wheels so that I can move around rearrange which I do actually pretty pretty frequently and move stuff around you know the thing a couple things that don't really get moved the table saw even though I got the mobile base for it um, I don't really move it uh, that much um, but I can if I need to if I need to clean up the floor or, or do whatever um, even the dust collector, the way I have it mounted up there, uh, is, is on wheels. It'll move along with the table saw. Uh, like I said, these work tables, this is one of the first projects I did. I built four of these work tables, which I was still wondering if maybe was a little bit overkill. Um, but um, so far, I think I've been pretty happy that I have them. Um, oh, the other thing that's not on wheels is the heavy bench. The heavy bench um, is a work in progress. It's a Harbor Freight um, workbench that I've added a bunch of uh, kind of structural reinforcement to because as it stands, you know, it wasn't that heavy or that stiff. It would kind of uh, vibrate around as you would bang on it. Um, so I added some stiffness that worked out pretty well. I did it kind of hastily. You know, there's just a thin line of glue kind of attaching those, those, uh, those beefier uh, structural uh, features. Um, and uh, you know, just I, I just kind of threw it together in a hurry. Uh, I think I could do a better job with it if, if I tried. Uh, it's working okay for now. I'm probably gonna regret not having done a better job. Um, but the thing by itself is maybe like, I don't know, 75, 100 pounds. But, uh, but once I threw all the tools on there, uh, and then I have a couple bags of concrete under, underneath, that, um, underneath that plank there on the bottom shelf. 250 pounds of concrete. Uh, at the end of the day, with, with everything on here, I think it's probably about a 400 pound bench. I also put some cork um, foot pads on the, on the feet to try to keep it from from uh, scooting around when I'm when I'm beating on stuff, uh, which um, I, I haven't had a chance to use it a whole ton since I put the concrete and the foot pads on there. So hopefully that works out and doesn't make it, you know, even bouncier, um, you know, less of an immovable object when I'm banging on stuff. Um, so we'll see how that works out. All right, we're well, kind of going counterclockwise here. We have, I have a roll-up door. That was one of the most exciting things when, we, when I saw this place. It's like, oh, I can have a, a, a big old barn door like Norm used to have. 
Um, and it's actually been pretty, uh, it, it's I, lately I've been using it during the day, um, just open up, uh, open up all the doors, the rolling door, that door, and I'll open up both the garage doors like halfway. I can't open them all the way, otherwise like all the crazy can see in here and, and bother me. So I roll them up halfway, and that gets, I think, pretty good uh, air clearance through this whole room, which is, which is pretty nice. Um, I figured I should probably put in a ventilation fan at some point, but it kind of seems low priority the way that I'm using these doors open. This is not an air conditioned or, uh, or heated shop. I want to get a small heater um, to just, just to provide a minimal amount of heat to, uh, to try to keep the rust down. I'm having some rust issues. Um, I don't know if I'll ever get around to air conditioning this, this place, but the point is in the summer to be able to open up all the doors and, and get some uh, cross, draft, cross draft. This is Sacramento, it gets quite warm. In fact, in the middle of the day, in the middle of the summer, I probably even can't do that much work out here, but at least I can uh, open. It's pretty cool in, you know, mixed feelings, having garage doors taking up one whole big wall of your, of your workshop is, is kind of a bummer, but I've been able to work around it pretty well with putting just tables in front of the doors. And I have an idea for putting, uh, putting up a frame uh, just kind of a, a, a wooden frame to kind of hang stuff on the inside of the door so the door can still operate open and close, but I, I have a place to hang things as if it were a wall. Um, so uh, let's see, yeah, it's the roll up. This is my um, my scrap cart. Now, the thing I like about this, I I don't know, I haven't, I haven't done a lot of uh, research but I don't think a lot of people store their scraps this way. I'm kind of proud of it. Um, what it is, uh, is there, there's a bunch of uh, uh, hard stops on the side. So I push materials in and it stops at the back. And so basically we're looking from this side, I can tell relatively which of my scraps are longer than others. And then I also try to kind of sort them by length uh, with smallest stuff in front and the lo longer stuff in back. Um, but just basically every kind of every kind of small scrap that's not a big long piece uh, goes in this cart, and it also kind of keeps a bounding box on how much scrap I'm keeping. You know, if I have a, some cutoffs that I think are valuable, I go to the scrap cart and see, oh well, do I have a bunch of other this kind of material, this dimension? If I already have a bunch of it, I'll just throw it out. If I don't, then then uh, then it's kind of easy and quick to tell whether or not I already have that um, and and where it should go. Um, so having a home, you know, having an organization system, uh, you can definitely go overboard with it. I'm sure, uh, you know, uh, label making every every little little thing, um, or you can try to kind of have a systematic approach. Uh, in in, in you know, so so that's kind of what I've gone for here is, is kind of have a system for for keeping keeping my scraps, not keeping too much. Um, and uh, even just getting around. So this is one of those, you know, wire shelving units with wheels on it. Uh, which is great when I'm working on a project. I can pull the scraps over close to me to where I'm working and, and, and go through them and pull out what I need. And then for cleanup, when I have a bunch of cutoffs and stuff that I need to put either, you know, uh, if I'm not throwing it away, I want to keep it to just have the cart right right there in the area to, to sort everything into and then, and then roll it back out of the way when I'm done. Now, um, one of the things that I'm kind of, this was my first welding project was a, was a, um, a rolling, a heavy duty rolling base for this wire shelving unit. The wheels that came with it are, they're great, but they just weren't beefy enough for, for this much weight. I mean, there's a lot of metal in there. Wood itself is, is even heavier than metal in, in a lot of ways. Um, just because it tends to be bulkier, you tend to have more of it. So that thing's freaking heavy, um, but to be able to, you know, I can roll it around, no problem. Um, so, uh, so that's really nice. You know, the only thing I have to be careful with is uh, uh, the, the end with stuff sticking out, you know, make, making sure I don't ram into something when I'm rolling it across the shop. Um, this is another thing I'm kind of proud of, the way I'm organizing my, uh, my sheets, sheet goods. Uh, it's basically just a bunch of, you know, two, two by fours, floor to ceiling that allow me to kind of vertically file things in here. Again, I try to kind of keep things in order, um, small to large. And again, my reference is the back of the storage area. 
everything is pushed up against the back. So I can tell just from looking on this side, you know, which things are taller and which things are wider than, than other things. So I can, I can pick out the appropriate um, scrap for the task at hand. Um, one thing I found when, I, when storing sheet goods vertically like this is they tend to sag and bow. And then when you go to use it, you have a bent uh, piece of sheet. Um, so what I've been doing is uh, putting these, these sort of uh, ratcheting uh, clamps um, I'm gonna go ahead and I got a project going here, but let me clean up a little bit. Demonstrate my scrap cart, get it out of the way. Um, so these are just like little ratcheting, um, you know, uh, woodworking clamps. Um, but what I do is I clamp a bunch of verticals together and I'm hoping, I just started doing this, but so far it seems to be working with just keeping the vertically stored material from sagging and bending and bowing. Um, and, then, uh, and then, like I said, I mostly try to go from small to large, but then here I had to go back down to small again because the eight foot high pieces, they won't clear my roll up. So I, I can't stick an eight foot piece in the very back, which would make sense for the largest pieces to be if I'm organizing small to large, but you know, I had to compromise there. Um, so, and then this is the long, uh, storage. Um, so long scraps are long, uh, long materials that I'm getting ready to do a project with, um, obviously go on this wall. I, I think this makes a lot of sense as a system for storing stuff that's not too wide, but that's really long. I mean, obviously lots of shop people store things this way. Um, and then uh, again, for like the cutoffs that, you know, aren't quite big enough to go in the vertical file, I just kind of stack them up. Again, kind of organized uh, by height from the floor. Basically, this is only organized from height, by height from the floor out. But then I try to keep the left edge of everything kind of even so I can tell by looking at the right which pieces are uh, wider or shorter. Um, and this chain is a, uh, it's just a chain hoist, uh, Harbor Freight, cheap one, one ton. Um, and what I've done is hook up a, a, a drill, a cordless drill uh, to the crank. Um, so normally you would have another loop of chain coming down and you pull on that other loop to raise or lower the hook. I took that other chain off and I put, uh, that would normally crank the wheel that this, that this cordless drill is now cranking. Um, and then, you know, I cut off the handle of the drill so I can control it remotely. This is, uh, you know, I, I'm sure, that <laughs> I wouldn't call this like OSHA compliant. This might be super dangerous. Don't try this at home. But I've been, I thought it's been freaking, freaking awesome to have just a, a you know, I don't have to have, I can have a powered um, gantry with a remote switch without having to run any power to it because it's all battery operated and cordless. And that's plenty of torque to turn that little uh, crank that's meant to be uh, turned by hand anyways. So this, I've used this a ton uh, to assemble things, to take things apart, to, um, uh, you know, to, to lift things up uh, onto the table so I can work on them. Um, and then gantry wise, this is Unistrut that I have going down the whole length of the garage. And I'm really proud of that because it's only an inch and a half, inch and five eighths deep draft taking away from headspace in my ceiling. So super tight, um, super low profile. Um, you can get these trolleys for Unistrut. I have a, a trolley there that's rated for like 700 pounds or something like that. So it's actually rated for much less than the winch, uh, than the pulley. Uh, it, than the pulley winch is. Um, so I have to be, you know, again, I gonna have to be super careful with this. And, and by the way, I'm probably gonna put this on YouTube. I'm probably gonna get a tons of flames uh, for how dangerous this is. You know, don't try it at home. I'm not sure how I'm gonna deal with the flamer comments. Um, I, you know, I probably won't even read them. Although I wanna get kind of feedback from people. I don't know. I, I'm not sure how I'm going to do the YouTube thing yet. That's, I think that's been part of my reluctance from my friend's encouragement to start videoing this stuff. Uh, so let's see. I think that's probably most of the coolest stuff. And then we'll just get around to the, to the rest of the shop. Um, my old table saw, 
which I want to turn into a welding table. I don't know. I, I like the idea because, you know, the top is nice and flat, um, but it's cast iron. I, I don't know exactly how well that's going to work out. Um, but uh, the other cool thing is it's exactly the right, you know, it's, it's that, uh, what is it, 40 inch uh, height, the same height as the other table saw, the rest of the work tables. You know, I standardized on the work table height. Um, uh, so, you know, if I have large, uh, large projects, thir 34 inches, uh, if I have large projects, I can, I can set them between multiple tables and ev have everything be level. Large welding projects, that seems like it might be um, useful also. Uh, in fact, I did use it that way, sort of, when I was working on the base. It doesn't look that large, but it's definitely larger than this table. Um, so to be able to span tables, and even, you know, all the tables are on wheels too. So even to just to be able to roll materials out of the way um, and, then, and then back into the work area when I need them is, is super handy. Um, these two tables over here never really move. Um, they're, I have them kind of fixed to each other in order to uh, flush mount the miter saw. So when I'm cutting long pieces, it can be supported. The long pieces can be supported by the material. Um, it's funny when I put this in, this was the first thing that started making it feel like, oh, this, now this is a real woodworking shop, uh, you know, ha having a miter, uh, miter station like this. Uh, I just built the dust collection box out of cardboard um, and that worked out great, you know, so easy to iterate on, <laughs> on cardboard. And, uh, you know, I, I think it, uh, it, it captures the air just fine. Um, like I said, a Harbor Freight uh, dust collector system down under there. Um, you know, I'm probably going to regret going with the cheap Harbor Freight dust collectors as, as opposed to just going with a uh, Clearview Cyclone or, or Onita Cyclone system. I mean, I, I've always been thinking about doing the Clearview. Um, but, uh, but again, kind of starting small and as I'm learning about the dust collection, um, what, what's working and what's not, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of taking it slow, but I'm also trying to be careful not to, not to do much, too much damage to myself. Um, let's see, I got a, a new sander there that I'm getting ready to start stripping the rust off of this table saw and turn it into a, because I think as it is, there's a bunch of rust on there, I can't get a good ground on it. Um, so need to remove that rust. Um, let's see, what else? Um, well storage. Oh, this is a, this is something I'm pretty proud of. The hand tool storage. Um, maybe there's better solutions for this but what i found is um uh, i was just throwing them up, up under the bench i was uh, i was kind of leaving stuff uh well no, i'm not even gonna say it um but ma like managing the cables like uh is it, just a pain in the butt like what do you wrap it around the thing what if you use it put it away and you're like oh crap i got one more cut to make i gotta pull it out again and unwrap it i always i felt all those things were kind of workflow barriers um and uh, uh, so having them sort of stored on top of the bench like this, what I do is I just drop all the cables down behind the bench and they all just, you know, they all just straighten themselves out and fall straight down just from gravity. Um, so then when I need something, it's easy, easy to just go grab it, and pull it out. And that, that's it, done. No unwrapping cables. Or and then again, to put it away, you know, just hang it up, drop, drop the cable down in there, and, uh, and I'm done. And everything is back in its home again. I can find it easily. Uh, I took care of the cable management. Uh, uh, made life a lot better that way. Again, this is another trick that I learned from my, um, from my uh, computer. Uh, um, date, like when I work in the data center, cable management is also an issue. And I, I learned a while ago, hey, like, let gravity work for you. You know, try, try to fix your cables high as much as possible so everything kind of falls down and in, independently and you can kind of see where things are and, you, you, you know, you can, you can pull on things and see where they're connecting to. And as much as possible, I try to use gravity to help me with my cable management. Um, and let's see, where was I going? Um, I hardly ever use that space heater. It's a Costco one, but it only angles upwards. Like so often I want to keep my feet warm and I can't, can't really point the heat at my feet. I need to figure out a better solution there. 
Um, this drill press um, is a very, it, it's a, I mean, uh, you guys will probably recognize the, uh, the Nova drill presses that have been coming out, uh, direct drive. Um, this is the metalworking version, which didn't come with a woodworking um, uh, drill press table. It came with a metalworking version with some, some drainage on it. And um, I, I'm pretty excited about these. I've, I've had a lot of struggles with this drill press. Um, when it came, uh, the, the, the taper on the inside of the spindle was not very precision. It was out by like seven thou, which is kind of crazy. Even a Harbor Freight drill press is going to run much truer than that. And this is far more expensive. I think this was like a $2,000 drill press. Um, but uh, the variable speed, you know, adjusting right here, um, the direct drive, um, the, the down feed attachment, so I can sort of precisely dial in depth uh, and, and, and hold it there as I, as I do like X, Y adjustments. And being, basically being able to do the milling. I've been watching a lot of YouTube machining and seeing the guys doing the milling. I'm like, that's, that's just so cool. I wanna be able to try to, to play around with that. So. Um, so, uh, you know, I, it's, it's been, it's taken a lot of work. I mean, it's pretty ridiculous. Every time my wife asks me what I've been doing, I've been like, oh, you know, working on the drill press, uh, you know, trying to get that, um, trying to figure out how I'm going to do, like, I basically ended up not using the chuck that came with the thing. I, I ended up using, buying, I wanted to buy a keyless chuck for it anyways, but I ended up using a chuck that goes in the, um, the ER32, um, call it taper on the nose of the spindle, which is another unique feature that allows me to do milling. Um, and that's running nice and concentric, um, much better than the, than the taper, uh, that's, uh, that, that Morris taper higher, like you should check the, the way the Nova machine, this, this Vulcan machine works is it's got two tapers in the spindle, one down low, that's the ER32 taper. And then as you, Internally, as you move up the spindle, it turns into a Morris taper. So you can put Morris taper tooling in there, which I really haven't used, especially since that Morris taper, I think, is not concentric with the bearings of the spindle. Um, so I, just just a, a long process of getting this thing to run well. It's still not running great. You know, I didn't need to change the grease in the spindle. This thing's kind of doesn't doesn't operate as smoothly as I feel like it should, you know, it, it should be going all the way home and banging up there or not banging, but at least, uh, you know, con consistent speed until it stops. Um, so I have to put some lighter grease in there or something. I'm still trying to learn how to, how to maintain and use all these machines. And then, uh, there was a practical machinist forum post, I believe of a guy that had this, uh, XY table. I have a cheap Chinese XY table, um, and uh, and then a cheap uh, sort of woodworking table that just clamps in the vise that's mounted to the XY table. Um, I'll just go ahead and show you that. Even though this is going to be a mess with all the chips, um, so it's like a quick uh, a quick clamp vise, which is which I, I really like. Uh, I just clamp the table in there. The table's got you know a flange. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, that I clamped down on. And so I have a nice big drill, drill table surface to work on, uh, but uh, I can take it off and clamp down uh, metal parts when I need to. And uh, one-handed operation, really nice when you're shooting videos. Um, and I think that's like mostly it. Um, I have like the, uh, the rigid sanding machine that a lot of people are excited about and happy with. Oh, this is one of those um, vibration sensors. Now I've moved away from these. What I was doing is I was having these trigger the air cleaning system. Uh, but the problem is, you know, if I was working and just I just set something down on here uh, and I wasn't actually doing any sanding, but I was just like using it for storage, uh, it would actually trigger the vibration center, sensor, turn on the fans. Um, that was getting kind of annoying. So I've switched over to these Wi-Fi sockets. I'm using the Tasmoda firmware, and that allows you to do uh, power draw detection. Um, uh, so basically now the air cleaners don't turn on unless I actually turn one of these machines on. Actually turn it on, not just bump it and make it vibrate. Um, I still might use some of those, for example, for like my welding gas. If I turn the gas on, 
uh, and then I don't get another event the same day that kind of indicates that I've turned the gas back off, I'll get a no notification just so I don't forget to leave like and leave the gas on. Probably that's better served by trying to just build up a good habit. Um, but uh, I don't know. I, I'm thinking I might use those vibration sensors for something. They worked pretty well for what I was using it for before, but, uh, but I've kind of moved away. It's just, just not, not quite good enough. Um, this is my metal cutting bandsaw um, with, a, with a little uh, you know, vertical fixture table. Um, it's funny, I've seen a lot of people do, doing this on YouTube but I, I came up with this, uh, this system and solution totally in, independently um, when I was building some, uh, some cabinetry uh, back in my condo. Um, I, built a, a, I built some cabinets with a big um, unistrut metal frame, and then I had just attached all the paneling to that metal frame. Um, and I was cutting a lot of this uni, unistrut, and I was cutting it with this bandsaw. You know, looking back, it was really slow going. Maybe that's why that project took me like six months of weekends to do. Um, but uh, I really like using the tool this way. Again, it's a little unsafe. You don't try this at home. You know, this blade is exposed here on the front, the side that you're working. Um, the capacity isn't huge. Oh, and the other thing is uh, this is a wire, um, you know, a battery system. But I, I ended up getting a power supply so I can use, like, it would go through batteries so fast. Um, so getting an external power supply and kind of hacking it on here has been nice. And then I have a, a foot switch, so it's foot switched operator. Um, so that's nice. Uh, I worry every once in a while I'm actually going to you know, trip on the switch and fall into the saw or, you know, nightmare situation like that. Um, but it's awfully handy not to have to like kind of reclip this, this, uh, this clamp on here to turn it on every time I want to use it. Um, that vacuum cleaner comes on automatically. Again, using like these Tasmoda firmwares and some server timer software that, that sees the power events. Uh, the, the vacuum turns on automatically when I'm using the sand. Oh, there's the fans. So here's one of my fobs. I'm gonna turn off the fans. So I figured I'd rather be kind of hassled by turning off the fans and air cleaning and safety system. I'd rather be hassled by turning it off than hassled by turning it on. Cause if I'm hassled by turning it on, I'm probably never gonna use it. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, and it, like this automatic vacuum thing, you know, that's not a new idea. They sell these things called eye sockets and I have one actually on the Mibersaw. That's what I was using originally. But those things are like 30 bucks or uh, yeah, 30, 35 bucks. Um, and you know, can only, uh, can only operate you know, so many amps of, of suction where this system, you know, those, little, those little sockets are like five bucks you know, if, you, if, you, if you get the right deal. And, uh, and you can have it turn on and off as many devices as you want. Like I said, I'm turning on all of the air uh, uh, dust cleaning fans and the vacuum thing for a you know, certain amount of time. Um, you know, the big high velocity dust cleaners, you, you don't wanna be spinning those up and down with every single cut. So I have those on a five minute timer. They come on, they stay on for five minutes. And if you haven't done any more activity in that five minutes, then they shut down. Otherwise they stay on as long as you're doing your iterative um, uh, operations. Oh, and here's one more thing, uh, the, the, the tool cart, right? So I've heard two kind of systems of shop organization, one, is where, I don't know, they, they call this like more of an island system where you have like an island in the middle of the shop where all of your frequently used tools are and then all of the big equipment around on the sides of the shop. Um, and that's kind of the idea, idea here, but even better, it's on wheels. So, um, so I, basically the island can move for, with me wherever it's convenient, wherever I happen to be doing, doing the work. If I'm doing a lot of milling over there, or if I'm doing a lot of table saw work or whatever, the thing can come with me. Um, and uh, that, that's been working out awesome. I, it's, it looks pretty, uh, um, like, it looks like a jalopy now with all the magnets uh, fixturing everything to it. And I'm a little concerned that all my tools are gonna get magnetized, but I bought a demagnetizer um that should should take care of that i think a lot of people have that problem um oh all the angle grinders like i decided to just go ahead and i think i have five of these from harbor freight they're like 
so cheap. They're like 20 bucks. And um, AVE over on YouTube did, he's done some teardowns of these things. And he's like, you know what? Uh, they're actually really not that bad for, and especially for that price, 20 bucks. So instead of switching grinding wheels and, and flap sanders and wire brushes, instead of switching them out all the time, I just have uh, I just have five of these with each of the wheels that I use on them and right handy right here near the vise. All right, um, I, is that all the cool stuff? I think that might, I'm probably, I'm probably leaving something out, but I think I hit on all of the things that I felt were kind of innovative. Um, and uh, yeah, so I hope you guys enjoy. Um, let me know if you have, uh, uh, I don't know if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna have patience to get around to it, like a lot of questions, like I'm, I'm not necessarily trying to be like a likable YouTube personality or anything. Or make money from it or anything like that but i mostly this is mostly for my friends um and all right i guess that's it enjoy and uh, have a good day okay kind of another just a couple little quick hits here i wanted to do of uh, stuff i realized that i left out of the last thing that i still think are innovative i want to talk about um so this uh my, my welding table this is actually uh, um, a kind of a, a bench that I built uh, before we got this place when we we're just living in the condo um, that basically can be totally broken down and set up by hand uh, without any tools um, and it, uh, it can be broken down into um, pieces that can that can basically take up very little space um, so those are metal um, uh, collapsible sawhorses um, that uh, I, uh, you know, obviously those collapse down to nothing. And then I bought these uh, casters that I've attached to the, to the bottom, uh, just with uh, some um, screws and washers that kind of help it stand, stand off that angled leg, but, but stand straight up. Uh, locking casters, um, this is just kind of slotted shelf standard metal that I used for uh, cross bracing um at the bottom uh other cool thing about this guy is it's adjustable height right like these metal these collapsible metal saw horses are adjustable height so you know since i base the table on it my table is adjustable height um uh i'm using sort of like tension uh with this uh plumbing tape the plumbing tape uh holds holds the tabletop flat um uh basically so the tabletop uh, homes itself on the sawhorse, again, using these metal shelf standards that I've screwed to the bottom of the plank. Um, so basically, you know, when I just set the top up there, um, it, kind of, it kind of homes in on the middle of that plank. And then these, this, this plumbing tape under tension holds the whole tabletop flat. Um, it does bow a little bit. Um, again, I have a metal standard here that I, that, that sort of limits that bowing. Um, it stays pretty flat. I think you can, you can see from here. Yeah, that, that's pretty darn flat. Um, and uh, holds a ton of weight. I mean, I, obviously I have a lot of weight on here right now with the gas. And I just, uh, I just tried to make this welding table top out of this perforated material that I had left over from a gate project, a metal gate project that we did um, out in front of the house. Um, and I wasn't sure, still not sure what to use this material for. Kind of thinking that the, uh, the welding tabletop might be cool, but it might be a problem with, you know, dust getting captured in those, in those holes and, um, and, uh, you know, and then, and then getting blown out when I'm, when I'm, uh, when I point the argon at it and, and, and just kind of, I'm wondering if I might have a sort of a little dust puff problem with this top, but we'll see how it goes. I didn't, wasn't sure what else to use that stuff for. Um, and, uh, oh yeah, these, these, uh, this plumber tape kind of just, it fastens in just like with a screw. So basically I do this turn buckle, then I can pull that screw up and the whole thing breaks. Um, this top is multiple layers, right? So I can have, it's actually, there's a third layer that I have as well. Um, so the top has some heft to it. Um, but when I go to take it apart, I just take it apart one layer at a time and I don't have to, uh, 
I don't have to lift around a big heavy top to go store it, you know, in my in my small condo, store it behind the couch or something. Um, handles there for kind of ease of handling. Um, uh, you know, more cross bracing back there in the back. And uh, I love this thing. It, it worked out great for me um, when I was in the condo. Um, I think I might take it back there. Um, I'm not sure I need all these tables uh, in here. Um, I was thinking at one point it would be kind of cool to have different height tables rather than having an adjustable height table. You just have a bunch of tables already set up that are already set up for different heights and you go work wherever makes sense for that particular project. I haven't been using it that way. I, I pretty much mostly work on the on the 34 inch tables. Um, I kind of, the, the heavy bench is a little bit lower. I'm not sure, maybe that's why I don't use it as much. Um, and then these tables over here are built with the same frame as the rest of the tables, but I just stuck sort of a, an extra sort of riser feature on here. And the idea was, um, and I've, I, I got this from someone else, the idea of having these little cubbies right underneath the table top where you can stash tools that are close at hand, kind of, kind of so they have a home, you don't lose them, uh, and keep the work, uh, the work piece on the table surface. Um, but you can see I'm not really using it for you know ad hoc tool storage. It's, it's really kind of things have kind of homed themselves in there. And uh, I don't really use those risers the way they intended. It doesn't really seem to matter that the work surface is a slightly higher height. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not really discriminating when, like how high I want the, the work to be when I'm doing any particular project. It always tends to come out here, probably because it's more in the middle of the shop. So anyways, I don't know if I need this guy anymore. I don't know if it makes sense to have a welding table that's so high like this. You know, if I'm, if I'm working up here, uh, if I'm doing TIG, I can't really use the pedal if I'm standing up. So uh, that's kind of a problem. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I don't know. But, uh, but I did think it was cool that it can be completely broken down by hand without tools. And it's, and it's really, really freaking sturdy and it breaks down really small and it rolls, yeah, yeah, oh, you know, um, that, that's my, that's my uh, collapsible workbench idea. I'll talk about this cart a little bit more. I mentioned that there's sort of these layers of mesh in here, you didn't see this side of it in the video earlier, um, but, uh, you know, magnets all over the thing and, uh, and so there's, you can see the green, I have a couple different kinds of mesh, right? So. Uh, I'm and and this wasn't exactly like you know fully designed. This is just like well, I think uh, I think this, these different sizes might be handy. Let's see what happens if I put them in. Um, and you can kind of see what's happening. You know, this 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 white size isn't get, getting used a ton. Um, the 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 um, sort of chicken wire hardware fabric part is hardly getting used at all. Mostly, it's this sort of semi-flexible plastic. Um, I think they use this stuff for sort of like um, temporary fencing and stuff like that. That seems to be kind of what I'm using the most. And then there's a couple layers of it here on the shelf. So the idea is the tools can kind of, uh, can, can kind of stab in at an angle and maintain that angle so they're, they don't kind of like end up drooping and falling out. Um, so that is it on the cart. And then I guess the last thing I wanted to talk about was my organization system. I don't have a ton of stuff, so I don't have a huge organization problem. Um, but I've been doing this forever with the organization in the bins. A lot of people don't like this because they feel like, you know, they can't really find stuff in the bins. I think the critical thing to making this work is you, you need a big flat area where you can pull the, pull the bin out and just dump it. Just, just dump the bin and see everything that's in there. And you don't want it to be a big hassle. You don't, you know, you want things to be, basically you need um, what you want. What I do is that everything goes into a, into a bin, into a Ziploc and before it goes into the bin. So, and then you have a, you know, you have a surface. Dump, dump the whole thing. 
Uh, everything is in clear plastic so you can see it. Um, and then, you know, because everything's already kind of kind of bagged up in bulk, it's no big deal when you dump out the bin to just throw it and toss everything back in there. And uh, close it up and put it away. Since I dropped something else. Um, on this table over here, I have this kind of backstop to, so when I do those box dumps, I don't lose stuff off the back of the table. Um, and then of course, you know, categorization is always a trade-off, like, you know, does the category make sense? Um, do, you know, do I have enough quantity of that category that it's going to overflow the box? Um, so, um, you know, I try to keep the categorization like kind of loose in general. I mean, obviously I think it's going to make sense for, for me and what I happen to have and think is going to be useful. Um, and then, the, you know, the other thing that happens is that uh, I try to keep the tables that are near the storage clear so I can do that sort of dump maneuver. Um, but I always ended up, end up, you know, setting stuff out on these tables and then, then it ends up kind of being a barrier to get into my storage and get stuff out the way, the way I want to. And so I, I would say, <clears throat> um, you know, obviously like, I'm, like bins are not an original idea, but, but big flat surfaces and then kind of sub containment within the bin. Um, it, it's, you know, like I have, I have these problems with necessarily the surfaces being available to dump onto, um, but you know, all the different approaches I think have their trade-offs and this one, this one kind of works, uh, I think, until I think of something better. Um, but I'm not really holding my breath. Okay, uh, thanks a lot. Um, hope you enjoyed.